Hello everyone, um, I think we're good to uh, start the presentation. Um, so good morning, afternoon and uh, evening um, for everyone who joined us today. Uh, my own name is uh, Andrew Casey and I'm a marketing executive at Chem, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's um, expert series webinar. I'm also delighted to welcome Cloud and Data, Cent Data Center Management um, MVP Richard Hicks who will be delivering today's presentation on Windows 10 always on VPN load balancing strategies. Before we get started, some quick housekeeping items. On the left of your screen, you will see a, a resources section which contains today's slide deck, um, a recent blog post written by Richard on today's subject matter, and you can also download a copy of Gartner's latest ADC market guide. Finally, um, we will dedicate some time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. So if you have any questions um, during the webinar you would like Richard to answer, then please pop them into the Q&A box on your screen and um, we'll get to those at the end. Um, so without further ado, um, Richard, um, over to you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Um, and thanks, everybody, for being here today. My name is Richard Higgs. I am the founder and principal consultant of Richard M. Higgs Consulting. And uh, as uh, Andrew alluded to, I am a Microsoft Most Valuable Professional, or Microsoft MVP. I am currently recognized in the Cloud and Data Center and Enterprise Security Award categories. Um, been in the business for a number of years now, actually more than two decades, actually. And um, I focus predominantly on enterprise mobility and security infrastructure consulting. So meaning I do a lot of work with uh, firewalls, VPNs, proxy servers, uh, less than uh, less of that today. Those are not very common. Um, uh, Multi-factor authentication, load balancing, and um, PKI. I do a lot of public key infrastructure or certificate services work. You can uh, uh, find uh, technical articles about all of these things at my website, directaccess.richardhicks.com. My social media platform of choice is Twitter. <laughs> I do more Twitter than Facebook or anything else. Uh, if you'd like to find me there, if you have questions or if you want to reach out, uh, need any assistance with anything at all, uh, always available there. Uh, Twitter handle is at Richard Hicks. So today uh, we are talking about Always On VPN. And if you are uh, not familiar with Always On VPN, uh, it is a uh, remote access solution from Microsoft and it is being uh, called the new direct access. Now, before you start freaking out, you might be starting to ask, well, what happened to the old direct access? Well, uh, if you have not heard the news, Microsoft uh, made a statement uh, probably about a year or so ago, maybe a little bit longer, that they were no longer investing in direct access. Now, what that means is that there will be no new features or functionality in, in direct access uh, in the future, meaning that the current state of direct access is what you get. Uh, they will, of course, fix things that are broken. They will fix uh, bugs and you know security fixes and things like that related to direct access. But there will uh, there's no new development of any technologies or any features or capabilities of direct access in the future. That being said, I want to be uh, crystal clear on this: is that direct access is not formally deprecated today. So direct access is still a viable solution. It is formally supported and will be for some time, but clearly the writing is on the wall when Microsoft puts something, uh, when, when Microsoft makes a statement like we're not investing anymore, uh, obviously its shelf life is not uh, infinite. It will expire at some point. So the good news about always on VPN, and again, there's kind of replacement for direct access is that it does provide the same user experience as direct access. So uh, those of you who have deployed direct access uh, have come to really know and love its features and capabilities, and certainly users love that. And always on VPN is the same thing, only different. It provides the same um, seamless and transparent always on remote access experience. Um, so in terms of that capabilities and those features, and, and again, the user experience, that is the same from direct access to Windows 10, always on VPN, so no worries there. Where 
essentially just going to do uh, provide the same thing, and we're just going to do it. Uh, the mechanics of how we do that is going to be a little bit different. The plumbing's probably a little bit different, but same user experience. So that is good. Um, with Always On VPN, um, it's important to understand that it, it really is designed for today's modern Microsoft infrastructure, whereas direct access was very tightly coupled and relied uh, intimately on things like Active Directory and group policy and things of that nature. Uh, Always On VPN is designed for the, our modern infrastructure in that it is designed to be implemented and managed predominantly using Microsoft Intune. So this is actually designed to be um, supported with an MDM or mobile device management platform. It does support integration with Azure Active Directory. And with that, of course, you get some additional features and capabilities like conditional access. So there's some when you join your systems to Azure Active Directory, there's some additional features that you can unwrap for always on VPN. Um, by the way, always on VPN has many new features and capabilities. I don't have the time to go into all of them in this webinar, uh, but you can certainly go to my website and probably find some information on that where I kind of outline some of the highlights of that. Um, with regards to the requirements for Always On VPN, uh, what does it take to set up an Always On VPN solution? Well, Windows 10 first. Uh, it's important to understand that Always On VPN is Windows 10 only. Uh, so if you have Windows 7 in your enterprise today, that uh, is not a supported Always On VPN client. You can certainly use uh, the VPN components, but it won't be always on, won't be direct access like. Uh, good news is it supports all SKUs now. So unlike direct access that required the enterprise edition exclusively, this will work with uh, professional or home or you know what have you. It doesn't have to be domain joined either. You know, that is, of course, optional. But as I would mentioned before, if you choose to integrate your clients uh, machines with Act, uh, Azure Active Directory, you get some additional features and capabilities there. Uh, on the server side, the infrastructure side, uh, you can use the Windows Server 2016, uh, the venerable RRAS service routing and remote access uh, for to terminate VPN connections. And EAP authentication or extended authentication protocol, EAP, is the authentication protocol of choice for our VPN clients. And that, of course, requires a RADIUS server. Microsoft's implementation of RADIUS is the NPS, or Network Policy Server. And so this is a, a, a pretty approachable solution for most organizations because, obviously, you know, you can license one, you know, you can license Windows Server 2016, you get these capabilities, and, uh, you know, you're good to go. You can set this up much, much like, and in, in, in similar to, uh, in, in many respects, to direct access. Now, the interesting thing about Windows 10 Always On VPN is that it is infrastructure independent where direct access absolutely required Windows Server infrastructure, domain join clients, specific enterprise SKUs, and all of that good stuff. This solution is much more flexible in terms of the requirements. So first of all, when I say infrastructure independent, I mean that you can implement an Always On VPN solution using third-party VPN servers. So for example, if you didn't want to use RRAS and you wanted to use Cisco, Checkpoint, Palo Alto, SonicWall, Fortinet, Sophos UTM, whatever it is that you wanted to use on the back end for your VPN server, you can certainly do that. The requirements there would be that it needs to support um, Ike v2. In other words, the, it needs to be able to support the VPN protocols that the Windows 10 client supports. Uh, it will also support any other protocols, assuming you have your third-party vendor has a VPN plugin client, meaning they have a VPN client that is available in the Windows Store. That you that you can use to build an always-on VPN solution. So keep in mind, you are not locked down or tied into Windows servers on the infrastructure side. And with regards to authentication, if you, uh, again, we're talking about using uh, NPS, you don't necessarily have to use that either. This will certainly work with any third-party RADIUS platform, like if you're using Pulse Secure, Clearbox, Free Radius, any number of third-party uh, independent third-party uh, radius servers or platforms, you can you can use those. It, it, it's it's a it's a fantastic solution in that case. Also, one of the selling points for me about always on VPN, much less tightly coupled with the infrastructure. Meaning, if I need to do things like, oh, I don't know, re-IP address a server, 
<laughs> if you've got if you have any experience with direct access, you know that even the trivial things uh, like that can be uh, pretty disruptive. Um, you know, moving the server from one subnet to another. Um, you know, adding and removing servers. Uh, you have a server that goes sideways, and you just want to do a wipe and reload. All of those things can be highly traumatic for your uh, direct access infrastructure. With always on VPN, it's actually pretty pedestrian, meaning if my VPN server goes sideways, I could literally wipe and reload without any sort of negative impact to my field users. They'll just connect as soon as the infrastructure is available again. So they're not so tightly coupled as direct access was. So that's huge. So let's talk a little bit about uh, our load balancing and redundancy strategies for always on VPN. Um, we're going to focus on eliminating single points of failure uh, in three crucial areas. So first of all, we're going to look at the VPN server. So in other words, um, in many cases, we don't want a single point of failure there, but also we may need to scale out. In other words, one VPN server may not handle all of our client connections. So we'll want to have more than one VPN server there. We'll also talk about uh, scaling out the radius infrastructure. Again, uh, redundancy and scalability is the is crucial for both of those servers uh, or services. And then finally, I want to take a look at the data center. So in other words, it doesn't really it doesn't really help us if we've implemented load balancing for and scalability and redundancy for the VPN servers and the radius infrastructure in our data center. If the data center is not available, I could have 100 VPN servers. It's not going to really help my clients, right? So we want to make sure that we have geographic redundancy in the event we lose a data center. And and by the way, when I'm talking about losing a data center, there are some trivial things that can take a data center offline. I was working with a customer not long ago for which um, they their ISP suffered a fiber cut. So it was a construction uh, a couple of blocks away. Fiber cut, boom, no data, uh, entire data center is offline. All kinds of redundancy. Uh, but, you know, again, dark because uh, because of an error like that. So we want to make sure that if you have multiple data centers and you have those requirements, that we're taking full advantage of those. Conceptually, this is what we're talking about. So we have our, our requests coming in from the Internet. Um, we have the Loadmaster Geo, which is used for, that, that's basically a GSLB solution, Global Server Load Balancing Solution. And that's going to distribute our requests amongst the data centers. So it's going to monitor each location, make sure it's available, and then uh, route those requests accordingly. By the way, and we'll talk about this in a later slide, uh, we can add some intelligence there. So if you are closer to DC1, we would send you there and, uh, as, that, as your preferred data center. But if you're closer to DC2, we can send you there as well. That's a really cool solution. And then, of course, we'll talk about load balancing VPN servers and NPS servers and making sure those are redundant and scalable. So let's talk briefly about our VPN uh, server load balancing. Now, the, the load balancing uh, tact that we uh, take it differs based on the protocols that we support. The two primary protocols that VPN will support, and, and by the way, let me back up for just a sec. For the purpose of our discussion today, I am assuming that we are implementing VPN using the Microsoft stack. So we're using RAS for our VPN server and NPS for our uh, authentication infrastructure. That said, all of the principles that I am talking about are applicable to all of those third-party solutions. So you can kind of interchange them mostly, but not most of what we're talking about here, again, focused on the, the Microsoft stack, but again, the fundamentals generally apply to third-party solutions. So uh, our the way we approach load balancing differs, again, based on the protocol. Now, the one of the protocols that RAS supports, and this is probably this, the protocol that most third-party VPNs would support as well, is IKEV2. So IKEV2 is a UDP-based um, uh, transport protocol, and it is fundamentally based on IPsec. So this is an IPsec VPN fundamentally. It offers good performance. It has excellent security, but the real challenge with IKE v2 in terms of operations is that it can be blocked by firewalls. So uh, UDP 500 and, and 4500, the protocols and, and transports that IKE v2 uses, are obviously well known, and security administrators uh, around the world and in, in a variety of networks may choose to deny traffic based on these ports. Uh, if I am the security administrator for an organization, I would certainly block those ports outbound. 
simply because uh, if you're using a VPN, it means you're probably trying to <laughs> circumvent my access controls um, and maybe my acceptable use policy. And God knows what's going on in there, right? You may be using it for uh, for good, but I don't know that as the security administrator, so I'll probably block that. I'll, I'll share with you also from personal experience. Uh, I travel quite a bit. And as I'm traveling around the country and around the world, I do find that it is IPv2 is blocked in a variety of locations. Uh, it was just a couple of weeks ago. I was in Chicago, just at a, a Hyatt hotel, right? And um, uh, for some reason, my always-on VPN wouldn't kick on because it's set to use IPv2. I launched uh, another connection uh, using another solution, and boom, it connected. So um, uh, in that case, it, it, it is known to be blocked. Uh, some hotels will block it for the purposes of wanting to charge you more to use it, by the way. I've seen that as, as well. So there are some, some challenges with IKE2. It does offer, again, a good security, but there are some operational drawbacks to it. Um, IKE2 and load balancing is, is interesting on the, the Kemp platform. And let's talk about this just a little bit. So uh, it uses UDP 500 for which... Uh, basically, it's using uh, the ESP, so encapsulating the security payload. The IGV2 protocol has a NAT detection capability built in, and if there is a NAT detected, a network address translator detected, anywhere in the path, it will switch to UDP 4500 so that it can be, uh, so that we can encapsulate the ESP traffic in UDP so that we can, of course, load balance it. Now, here's the challenge. On the KIMP platform, um, since this is UDP and since it is connectionless, the first connection happens on UDP 500 and the second will happen on 4500. We need to ensure that that traffic lands on the same real server because if it if it lands on you know VPN server one uh, for 500 and then it switches to the second one for UDP 4500, of course the second server won't know anything about that initial connection and it will drop. <clears throat> In that case, we could uh, try to use some of the advanced capabilities of the load master. So, for example, switching to layer 7 and using port following. The challenge is, of course, it doesn't work. <laughs> it actually breaks uh, IP, uh, the IPsec. So the IPsec detects some monkeying around with the traffic there, and it fundamentally breaks. So the recommended guidance today for load balancing IPv2 is actually not to do it. <laughs> so in this case, it's the only option today, at least at this point, is to use multiple public IPs, translate those or NAT those to each of the, the servers, and just kind of skip the load master in that case. Now, that being said, uh, I've, I've um, had some conversations with the support team uh, at Kemp, and I hope to maybe work on this solution with them a little bit more closely. Perhaps we can find um, a workaround or a resolution for this. So at some point in the future, we may have a better story for load balancing Nike V2, but for today, unfortunately, we do not. Now, that being said, uh, the other protocol that RRAS supports is something called SSTP, or Secure Socket Tunneling Protocol. SSTP is a fantastic VPN protocol. It is supported uh, by Windows uh, client machines only. Uh, but since we're talking about Windows always on VPN or Windows 10 always on VPN, we're assured that the clients always support it. So that's good. This is a TCP-based protocol, and it uses TLS, Transport Layer Security. So SSL, it's SSL-based. Uh, it offers excellent performance. It is reasonably secure as long as you, the administrator, take some steps to ensure that one, the authentication mechanisms are secure. That means using EAP and using EAP with client certificates preferably. So avoid the use of um, just you know, regular username and password. Also, it means that we need to pay close attention to the TLS configuration on the server. Now, with the load master, it makes it really stupid simple to do, and I'm going to show you how to do that. And you will, uh, uh, it's it's a it's a way to really make the solution much more secure. So not only do you get the performance and scalability, but you get additional security when you front this with the load master. The advantage to SSTP is that it is available everywhere. Meaning, if you have an internet connection, you have access to probably at, at a minimum bare minimum, port 80 and port 443, right? Because, you know, you can't get to a website anymore without even port 443. So in that case, SSTP works, and it works everywhere. In that scenario I described a, a couple of slides ago when I was in the hotel in Chicago, it was the same thing. Ike V2 wouldn't work. I launched my SSTP VPN. Boom, I'm connected to my, my home network, and uh, I'm good to go. So in that case, the fallback to SSTP is helpful, 
but there are <laughs> honestly there are um, there are some uh, um, there are some positive benefits and some aspects there that I think uh, are probably good to pursue in terms of supporting SSTP exclusively. So it meets the needs and the requirements. It always works. You don't have to worry about it. And so fantastic solution. You'll also see that it lends itself very well to load balancing uh, because it is purely and simply TCP port 443. If you can load balance a website, you can load balance SSTP. So there's two options for this. First is uh, SSL forwarding. Now, that means basically just accepting inbound TCP port 443 on the load master, on, on the uh, virtual server, and just simply forwarding that encrypted traffic back to the backend server. So no termination, no offloading, just send it to the backend server. Um, that's kind of the quick and dirty method. Uh, it certainly works, but there's some additional benefits to performing SSL offload, meaning that if we offload the SSL uh, decryption and, and, and decapsulation and everything to the load master, uh, we gain performance and scalability. Meaning, if, if the load master is performing all of the SSL um, uh, handshake and, and, and encryption, decryption, and all of that good stuff, we offload that from the VPN server. It frees up our VPN server in terms of resources, so less memory consumption, fewer CPU cycles consumed. Meaning, we can accept or we can uh, sustain more concurrent connections on the VPN server, and generally speaking, just uh, improves performance. So I want to take just a minute and go through uh, a demonstration of load balancing SSTP. You'll find that it's pretty straightforward, but there's a couple of things that I want you to be uh, keenly aware of here. Um, one second, let me find my, there it is, great. So here is my lab virtual load master. This is running in my Hyper-V lab, of course. Um, and uh, in this case, I'm just going to come over to uh, add a new virtual service. And I'm going to provide my uh, virtual service address. Uh, uh, this, the port, of course, is AS443. We'll just call this SSTP. Oops. And this is TCP, so we'll go ahead and add the virtual service. And at this point, uh, we've created the virtual server. I want to do a little bit of housekeeping here. So for example, um, the scheduling method, uh, method by default is round robin. That may not be ideal, so I'm going to switch that to, I, prefer, I, I really like least connection. That's kind of my favorite, but ultimately, uh, this is uh, you know, y y your choice, really. Uh, I'm going to choose least connection, and my persistence options, we're going to choose source IP address here. Uh, in terms of the timeout, again, that's up to you. I usually accept the defaults, but you can change that as you need. And at this point, I'm going to go down here and add the real servers. Um, in this case, I'm just going to select TCP connection only for the health check. We'll provide the port, 443, and we're going to add a new real server. And let's see if I can remember those IP addresses. 1.230, I think is the first one. And 231, I think, is my second server. Perfect. Um, cool. So we've added my real servers. And at this point, I have a... Um, let's go back. Okay, at this point, basically, I have an SSTP uh, load-balanced VPN. I have my two real servers, and I've done nothing more than I'm just basically forwarding 443 traffic back to these backend servers. And again, that might be you know uh, well and good for maybe a small deployment, but again, if I want to gain uh, additional scalability and improve performance, I'm going to want to do some SSL offload. And the way to handle that, of course, is to go ahead and modify this virtual server, and then for SSL properties here, select Enabled for SSL Acceleration. It's going to give me a warning about my SSL certificate. That's fine. We'll fix that in just a second. Crucially, though, we want to enable SSL acceleration, but we also do not want to select the option to re-encrypt. In other words, we want to offload SSL here, but then we're going to send traffic using TCP port 80 to the back-end servers. So don't select that option. We'll choose our certificate. In this case, this is my wildcard certificate for my lab environment. Don't forget to click Set Certificates. And then for the Cypher Set, this is crucial. I recommend that you use best practices. 
when you select best practices without doing anything on the VPN server, you will now have improved the security of your VPN greatly. In meaning, if you were to go to the Qualys SSL Labs server test site and run the test against this VPN server, uh, a Windows Server 2016 box in its default configuration would receive a, a grade or a rating of B. Uh, in this case, if I set this to best practices, it will automatically receive a rating of A. So that means an A rating is, is, is obviously desirable, and we want to ensure the best security. So without doing anything on the server, we've all already improved security. So, so now at this point, you'll notice that I've implemented uh, offloading, I've selected my certificate. If I go down to the real servers, you'll notice that they switched to port 80. That's excellent. Now, unfortunately, I'm not quite done in that I still need to make a change on my VPN server. So let me jump over to my RAS VPN server here and see if I can find that real quick. Uh, great, so here's my VPN server. I'm um, just going to right-click on the VPN server in the RRAS Management Console, choose Properties, go over to the Security tab, and you'll see for SSL certificate binding, I have my wildcard certificate stipulated here, but if I'm doing SSL offload, I need to select the option to use HTTP, meaning this server with this option set will now accept VPN client connections uh, with SSTP, uh, on port 80 without requiring the encryption. So in other words, we've done the encryption, and we've terminated that connection at the load balancer, and on the back end, we're just passing port 80, meaning this server no longer has to perform the SSL decryption and all of that good stuff. So in that case, I have uh, improved not only the scalability, but the performance of the solution as well. So if you click OK here, it's going to ask you to restart the services. It'll restart, and at that point, you're good to go. So. Huge win for that, and um, definitely, um, unless you have a really small environment, you're only going to support a couple of users, probably doesn't make any sense to do that. But if you're you know, supporting any more than probably 50 or 100, uh, that's a huge win. Definitely want to make sure that you take advantage of that. So let's talk about our authentication infrastructure. In terms of RADIUS, um, we can provide load balancing for RADIUS as well. But load balancing radius in NPS has some unique requirements. Um, so first of all, uh, in terms of radius, of course, it's a UDP-based protocol. There are two port ports that are used primarily for radius, uh, that being uh, 1812 for authentication and UDP 1813 for accounting. When you set this up, and we're going to do this in just a second, uh, it's crucial that we use port following, which is an advanced feature of the load master load balancer that will ensure that our UDP connections end up on the same server. Um, in theory, again, this should work with Ike v2, but it does not today, but it does work fine with radius. So in other words, meaning so since UDP is connectionless, when a uh, when a UDP request comes into a virtual server, um, a, another follow-up request, there's no way for the load master to really know if that's part of a stream or part of a, a connection, whereas with TCP, we could certainly do those types of things a lot more easily. Here, we use port following to ensure that if, if requests come in on 18.12, any requests from the same uh, machine, or the same IP address anyway, would then also land on the same server. And that just ensures that our accounting requests go to the same server as the authentication. At the end of the day, it's not super critical because if the accounting requests end up on one server and the authentication requests on another, we can we can correlate those logs and, and we you know they're all logged at some place. It just may not be convenient for us. So I like to use port following because it kind of makes things a little more tidy. Now, in terms of certificate requirements, uh, those are unique in terms of uh, the the radius configuration. So uh, when we when we set up the radius server, we need to of course provide uh, a couple of certificates for uh, or one certificate on the server for that to work, and it needs to be issued by your private internal PKI. Now, and, and again, that's to support uh, EEP or extended um, authentication or in, uh, uh, yeah EEP authentication. So. Um, in terms of that, the certificate would normally have the subject of, or the subject name would actually be the server name or the host name of the, the NPS server itself. 
if we are going to load balance the RADIUS infrastructure, we need to change that a little bit. So in terms of the certificate requirements, the certificate then would simply be, the subject name would be the FQDN of the cluster, meaning the subject name is not the server name anymore, it is the cluster name. And I'm going to describe this in a little bit more detail in the next slide, so uh, bear with me. So the subject name is going to be the cluster FQDN. The subject alternative name under the SAN entries need to be the cluster FQDN and the NPS server host name. Now, let me, let me kind of expound upon that because this is crucial for this to work correctly. Let's say, for example, we had a cluster FQDN, and in my lab, this is what it looks like. The cluster FQDN is nps.lab.richardhicks.net. My first NPS server's host name is NPS1. And of course, it's FQDN nps1.lab.richardhicks.net. And the second server is NPS2. It's, in, it's fully F, it's, uh, FQDN is nps2.lab.richardhicks.net. In this scenario, my certificate would look like this. I would have an SS, or I'd have a uh, certificate issued by my public key infrastructure, my internal PKI. The subject name would be the cluster name, nps.lab.richardix.net. But the subject alternative name, the SAN field, would include two entries, the subject name being the cluster name and the second SAN entry being the host name of this server in FQTN format. If you do those two things, you'll be in good shape. Now, what this means, of course, is that you can't use certificate auto-enrollment because we have to supply these in the request. So that's kind of a bummer. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, you have to set your template up. Maybe you extend the lifetime of the template if you want to do that. But uh, fundamentally, that is the way you would set this up. Now, let's go over and take a look at our uh, configuration of the load master in this particular scenario. So. Uh, so we're going to add a um, so we're going to add a virtual service, and in this case, uh, my uh, is 207, I think. Port is 1812 in this case, and we'll give it a name because this is going to be crucial. So this is Radius Authentication, and the protocol is UDP. So we'll add this service. Again, persistence options, I'll just choose source IP address, and, and uh, I, again, prefer least connection, but you can do this in any uh, variety of ways you want to do. Real servers, your options for real server checks, of course, are limited when you're using uh, UDP, so I'm just going to leave the default of uh, ICMP or ping. Make sure that your Windows firewalls on your NPS servers are allowing inbound ICMP echo requests so that this doesn't fail. <laughs> so we'll choose Add New, and we'll add each of our servers. Uh, 8 and 209, I think, are my servers. Great, 1209, perfect. And then we'll go back. So at this point, everything looks good, but we need to make another change. Well, actually, let me back up. This is for our radius authentication. We also need to add our radius accounting. So 172.16.1.207 is the virtual address. 1813 is the port. This is radius accounting. And protocol is UDP. So we'll add the virtual service. Again, we'll choose this, RCP, fine, lose connection, good. Uh, and add our virtual or our real servers. And everything looks good there. So nine. Yeah, great. So all of our real servers and virtual servers are set up. But again, we need to make a change here to ensure that our accounting requests land on the same server as our authentication requests. So in order to do that, I need to switch this over to L7. So let's go and switch this off. And basically, the way this works is you just simply disable or uncheck the option to use uh, or to force L4. So we'll select that. And one of the things you'll notice is as soon as you uncheck the option to force L4, uh, you'll see that we have some additional advanced properties. We don't have to do anything here on the uh, authentication virtual server, but we will go back and modify our um, uh, accounting virtual address, 
and so we'll uncheck for cell four. And in this case, you'll see under the advanced properties, we want to enable port following. And in here, we want to select the virtual server that is the, um, the authentication um, virtual server, so that, that VS there. So we'll select that. And at this point now, what will happen is any requests that come in from a client machine on UDP 1812 will automatically use this same uh, virtual server for any requests on 1813, meaning uh, our, our accounting requests should then land on the same server as our authentication requests, and it makes our log correlation just that much easier, a little, little more tidy in terms of uh, uh, trying to track down requests. All right, so let's talk a little bit about geographic redundancy. Again, as I mentioned before, we want to kind of focus on uh, the data center and making sure that we're eliminating all of our single points of failure, the data center being one of those. So uh, in terms of geographic redundancy, what we're going to do is we're going to configure a global VPN or uh, FQDN for our VPN infrastructure. So each of your entry points might have their own specific name. Uh, in, in a standalone infrastructure, when we're building out a um, multi-site infrastructure, what we want to do is use the same host name across for each of the VPN servers. So each VPN server in each location would have the same FQDN. And then, uh, and again, so and for our example here, I'm just going to use VPN.example.net. So each server has an SSL certificate installed with the public host name in this case, vpn.example.net. Uh, all servers have the same name. And then what happens is you'll create a DNS record um, for vpn.example.net, but instead of that being a host record or a C name, you're actually going to create a name server record, and you're going to delegate that DNS name or namespace to the Loadmaster Geo. So the Loadmaster Geo, the way it works is it basically, it's just a DNS server. So it's going to listen on UDP port 53, and uh, any of those name resolution requests from your public DNS now will, of course, go to the, uh, uh, to, the Le uh, to the Loadmaster Geo. It will respond with an IP address. And of course, before it can do that, we need to define our selection criteria and enter our public IP addresses for each of our locations. So let's take a quick look at how we might do that on our Loadmaster. I can't show you, of course, the public DNS side of that. But um, that information, by the way, is well documented on the um, Kemp website. So if you go to the Kemp website and just look up uh, Loadmaster Geo, you will find um, some detailed prescriptive guidance on how to set that up, uh, the DNS side. But as far as the Loadmaster side, let's take a look at that. So in here, I'm going to actually go to the um, Manage FQDNs under the load balancing, global load balancing um, uh, screen here. And I'm going to supply my public host name. In this case, I just use vpn.example.net, um, uh, right? Uh, okay, so we'll add the FQDN. And what we're doing is we're basically telling the Loadmaster that you are going to be authoritative for this namespace. So I'm going to select my uh, selection criteria. Now, round robin, of course, means just distribute requests, you know, um, one after the other to each of the sites. Um, you may want to choose a variety of, of different selection criteria for uh, a number of reasons. Um, fixed weighting is popular if you're trying to do active passive. So in other words, if you want all of your requests to go to one data center, and if it fails, then go to another, that's where you would use fixed weighting. And with fixed weighting, of course, um, you would set, uh, let, let's see here, let's set a couple of IP addresses here. Um, let's see. Let's see, do that. And uh, uh, let's see. We'll just throw a couple of bogus IPs in here. And what happens is with fixed weighting, I can then define my weight. The weight, the way the weighting works is the, the, uh, the weight parameter that's set to the highest will have priority. So let's say if we have one set to um, 1,000 and one set to 500. With fixed weighting, what would mean is, what this would mean was that all of the requests would go to this, um, uh, or uh, in this case, all of the requests would be responding with this IP address. And then if this particular 
um, uh, IP address was unavailable, it would then fall back to this one. So that's what fixed weighting is. So if I want to do active, passive, or primary, secondary, that's how you do that. Um, you can do that in a, in a variety of ways. There's a, some other options. Another popular one is proximity-based. This is one that I like to use, and this is one in which um, we might want to um, have customers or clients that are tr uh, mobile, that are traveling around the world, we might want them to connect to an optimal VPN server. So for example, let's say I have a VPN server in New York, London, and in uh, Hong Kong. It doesn't make sense for a, a user traveling to Hong Kong to connect to the VPN server in New York. There's, there's one right there in Hong Kong for them. So in that case, what we want to do is do proximity-based. And in this case, you would actually define the physical location of your data center here. Uh, and once you would do that, what, would, what that means is that the loadmaster would look at the source IP address for the incoming DNS query, the DNS request, and then it would match a, an IP address or a location to that physical proximity. So if I happen to be, you know, in, in North America, uh, let's say I'm traveling to the Midwest somewhere, the closest one is going to be New York, it would be able to map that and then connect me to that server. And of course, if that server was unavailable, it would route me to the second nearest one. But that's a really common use case and one that I get called on to deploy frequently because it doesn't make sense, again, to, you know, to, to to be traveling around the world and connecting to, you know, uh, a <laughs> connecting to a remote location when you have a perfectly suitable VPN server that is much closer to to you and in, in, uh, where you might actually be at the time. So anyway, that kind of brings me to the end of my session. Uh, I hope uh, you found that uh, uh, this was informative and useful. Uh, but kind of in the summary, I just want to follow up on a couple of things. As I had stated before, always on VPN. Uh, is an excellent solution for Windows 10. Again, kind of the replacement for direct access. Uh, although direct access isn't going anywhere immediately, it is not going to live forever. So probably a good idea to start looking towards the future, maybe start considering uh, your options for always on VPN. Uh, Windows 7, by the way, is going to end support just here uh, less than two years, I think, right? Um, so now if you're still running Windows 7 and that's holding you back, um, you know, at some point you got to move. And at that point, if you get to Windows 10, then maybe this is a viable alternative for you. Uh, it has the advantage of being infrastructure independent, so it's very flexible to deploy in your organization. And again, don't forget, of course, you can use the KEMP Loadmaster and Loadmaster Geo to eliminate single points of failure uh, at the VPN level, at the server, uh, at the authentication level, and as well as the data center level. So that brings me to the end of the session. I want to open it up to Q&A. Andrew, um, any questions for me at all? Or if anybody has any questions now, go ahead and post them in the Q&A window. I'd be happy to answer those for you. Andrew? Uh, yeah, we have a couple here. Um, a couple throwing in now. We have one question here saying, um, shouldn't this SAN contain both MPS1 and MBS2 on the certificate? Uh, it, no, it actually just needs to include the host name or the, the subject name of the um, cluster, right? So that's uh, a DNS record that we created in DNS. That the uh, cluster subject name, the cluster name in DNS resolves to the virtual IP address on the loadmaster. And then the server only needs to know, only needs to have, the certificate only needs to have the SAN entry for, uh, the, the additional SAN entry for the host name for itself, for the server. So it, uh, each server would then have um, uh, the, the cluster name and then its own FQDN. It doesn't need to know, the subject alternative names do not need to include the other NPS servers in the cluster. So it only needs to know itself and the cluster name. That being said, there's nothing wrong with adding additional SAN entries, but they're not in, they're not required. Okay, um, we have another one here. Does always on VPN have an NLS-like component, and how does it work? Ah, good question, good question. It so it does not have an NLS 
as Direct Access does. So uh, if you're familiar with Direct Access, we had the network location server. Uh, it was the bane of many Direct Access administrators' existence because uh, if there were problems with the NLS, all of our Direct Access clients that were on the internal network would go sideways, and it would cause it, – it, it was tremendously – um, it's just tremendously challenging and quite disruptive. That being said, there is no NLS requirement for always on VPN. But if you don't take uh, additional steps, the VPN will connect on the inside network as well as the outside network. So it'll connect any time. Um, when you set up an always on VPN connection, uh, there is an option in the Profile XML to include the trusted network detection element. So if you include that in your XML, what you're going to do then is tell the client to look for this specific DNS, uh, connection, uh, DNS connection suffix called whatever it is or whatever your internal domain name is. And then if you see that on the internal interface, then don't light up the VPN. So it has trusted network detection capabilities that they're optional and it doesn't require any additional infrastructure. It's implemented entirely on the client side. So it's not as, uh, it's certainly not as brittle and delicate as um, the NLS in direct access. Um, we have one more here. Can Windows 10 always on VPN server support older clients like 8.1 on the same server? with older style of VPN configuration. So, so yeah, so the VPN server, whatever it is, whether it's RRAS or any sort of third party, um, most certainly can accept VPN connections from other clients, not necessarily always on clients. Um, so, no, absolutely. So, yeah, you have that flexibility. We'll, we'll want to set up the authentication parameters such to the as such that so that they'll work with the always on VPN. So in other words, we want to use client certificates because that makes it seamless and transparent, right? So if the user has to enter the credentials every time, it's it's not not super ideal, right? But if we're trying to make a direct access like solution, we'll want to use certificate authentication, uh, use E for authentication, and you can set up the NPS server in such a way uh, to do that. But if you have a need to support uh, third-party clients or any other clients that are not using always on and let's, let's say for example you want to use Mac and they want to use a different protocol absolutely you just set up the v, the the um, you would just set up the VPN server and the NPS server accordingly and yeah so absolutely there, there's no restrictions or limitations on that you can you can definitely do that Another one we have just in, um, do all on VPN allow split tunneling so internet access still goes out via the local circuit rather than being piped back to the corporate network? So the answer is yes. Um, always on VPN is very flexible in terms of that, so you can and you can actually define split tunneling or force tunneling. The good news is that force tunneling actually works <laughs> and, and works without issue in always on VPN. The force tunneling uh, story is much, much better in always on VPN. It actually works quite well. So if you have any experience with doing force tunneling with direct access, you'll know that it's quite painful. Um, in, in always on VPN, it's much easier. But no, absolutely. Uh, you can define split tunneling in always on VPN, and then you would just actually define the, uh, the routes for your internal infrastructure. And at that point, you know, any, any traffic that's uh, headed for the internal network would go over the VPN. Any other traffic would just go to the internet directly. So yeah, split tunneling is fully supported. Um, another one we have just in. Um, will the RRS console be updated in future to show all the low bandwidth connections from all servers as with um, low bandwidth and direct access? Ooh, good question. Um, I would I would say no, probably not. Uh, I don't expect them. I don't expect Microsoft to invest heavily in RAS. I think R RAS is one of those things. Uh, RAS as a solution has been around since the beginning of time. <laughs> RAS. I remember working with RAS and NT4 in the late 90s, and honestly, the management console hasn't changed much since then. So I don't expect them to spend um, a lot of energy in that. And the reason for that is because since it supports third parties, I think that they I think that they proffer RAS as a solution. But uh, my sense is that you know it's kind of a take it or leave it thing. Uh, 
uh, and that um, I, I don't. I, I'm and, and let me clear. Let me clarify that. I may entirely be wrong with that. This is purely speculation on my part. But if they haven't updated the the management console for our res in 20 plus years, I can't see that happening anytime soon. Um, so I, I wouldn't hold your breath on that. Uh, I think if you have advanced requirements for VPN, then using a third party VPN is probably uh, a, a better choice. Um, another question here, is there any concern about encrypted traffic from the border to the internal server for SSL offload? Um, of course. Yes, absolutely. So when we're talking about SSL offload, um, by inherently and by design, we now have traffic passing in the clear from the, uh, from the load master to the VPN server. And ultimately, that's a decision you have to just, you know, choo choose to make, right? So, um, ideally, the load master and the real server, uh, in this case, the VPN servers, would be on the same subnet, probably on an isolated subnet and a very well protected one. And so, the risk of exposure, I think, is minimal. But at the end of the day, that's a decision you have to make. Um, is that a risk that you're willing to accept? Uh, the challenge being that, yeah, I have some traffic in the clear here. Um, the trade-off being I get a better performance and scalability. At the end of the day, uh, you'll have to decide whether or not that's a risk you want to accept. Uh, if it is, great, then you get the benefits of, of added security and performance or added performance and scalability, I'm sorry. Um, if you don't want to accept that, then you can certainly encrypt. And at that point, if, if you're going to, if, if you don't want to accept that risk and you want to encrypt from the client to the VPN server, there's probably no point in offloading the SSL. Uh, at that point, you probably just want to configure the load master just to forward 443 encrypted back to the, to the server. Uh, in that case, though, you'll want to pay close attention to the TLS configuration on the VPN server to ensure that it is optimized. So uh, go to the Qualys SSL Lab server test site, test your VPN servers, uh, and then make any changes. Uh, you, you'll probably have to disable RC4 at a minimum and then optimize some of the cipher suites to ensure that, uh, that the, that the, uh, the uh, server is, is secure optimally like that. Um, there's another one here. Question: um, How big is the gain in um, speed percent percentage-wise when using um, SSL offload? So your mileage may vary. Uh, that's not. Uh, it's difficult to quantify that and to put a specific number on it because it there's there's so many determining factors. Um, but it can be substantial. Obviously, the the performance gains are going to come when you have heavily loaded servers. So if you the more servers you have and the more connections you're supporting, the the bigger the gain is. I would say if you're going to offload uh, SSL, the the performance gains might be imperceptible if you're talking about a few hundred users. Um, you may notice some you know um, some reduced CPU utilization or something on the server. Uh, I think the uh, when the real gains there come from when you're supporting you know thousands or tens of thousands of clients and you're scaling out across multiple servers. That's where the biggest performance gains are. Um, but in terms of actual numbers, I don't necessarily have specific numbers because they, they vary pretty greatly. Um, thanks, Richard. I think we take um, just one more here. Um, we have one question here, a good question. Um, are there any benefits of having Kemp over um, F5 big IP. Um, <laughs> there are numerous. <laughs> um, so first of all, first of all, the, the F5 platform is is obviously an excellent platform, uh, and there are many excellent solutions out there. Uh, I think some of the selling points for the Loadmaster platform um, are, first of all, uh, in terms of cost. I mean, I think it is um, a much more affordable solution. You know, uh, Camp also has kind of pioneered this, um, you know, kind of pay as you go or metered licensing uh, subscription. So one of the benefits to the camp is that you're really not paying for the load balancers anymore. You're just paying for how much you use. So if you want one load balancer or ten, they don't care. Uh, you're just going to pay for the for the uh, for the usage. So in terms of that, you can scale these solutions up uh, and then basically pay for what you're using. So they are a much more a cost effective solution, and they offer you know comparable 
performance, uh, you know, uh, you know, it may not have quite the feature parity. I think maybe the, some of the other solutions offer, you know, some more advanced capabilities and things like that. But honestly, uh, it, for many of my customers, the Loadmaster meets their requirements, uh, ends up providing the best performance uh, or acceptable or on par performance. And then, you know, it, it's a solution that ends up being, uh, you know, uh, much more approachable in terms of cost. And by the way, if you look at uh, the ecosystem for, for Kemp as well, uh, they have some uh, excellent complementary solutions. If you take a look at, you know, um, Kemp 360, uh, which allows you to manage all of your Loadmasters across uh, your on-premises and in the cloud, uh, Azure, AWS, everything, and you have one holistic view of all of your load balancers in your organization, uh, that's pretty compelling, and it integrates very tightly with the Loadmaster. It allows you to do things like move virtual servers from one Loadmaster to another, even replicate configurations, do updates, things like that. Uh, by the way, it does integrate with the F5 as well. So if you have F5s today, you can actually use uh, the, the Kemp 360 uh, to monitor and manage those solutions as well. So it's a pretty compelling platform, and I think it's one that uh, you'll find is uh, works quite well and, and will end up probably saving you a bunch of money as well. Yeah, I totally agree with you there, Richard. Good answer. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think um, we'll call it a day there. If, if anyone has any more questions, um, feel free to pop them into the window. We, we can always um, get Richard to follow up um, after the webinar. If you bet, Andrew, if there's any questions that come up after this, then just uh, send me send them over to me, and I'll be happy to respond. Okay, um, and just also to note, because some people asked, um, yes, the, there will be um, a recording of the webinar, so it'll be made available on demand, and um, I will be sending out an email um, in the coming days with a link to that, so you'll be able to go back over everything um, Richard presented on today. Um, and once again, Richard, I'd like to thank you for um, the presentation and the, the great insights. And um, thank you for yeah, thank you for having me. We'll have some more series uh, webinars coming up, so we hope to see you again um, in the near future. Excellent. Great. Thanks. Okay. Looking forward to thanks, it. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone.